Thank you.
清香的新棉，清香的新棉。
His name is above. His name is above depression. His name is above loneliness. Oh, His name is above disease. His name is above cancer. His name is above every other name. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, your name be praised. You are the Almighty God. In you there is grace, righteousness, love, and compassion. Please forgive us for our trespasses and guide us going forward. Enlighten us so that we act according to your will and that your name be glorified. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we welcome the message from Pastor Lin De Zhao. Dear brothers and sisters of Seattle Formosa Christian Church, this is Pastor Albert Lin. It is of great joy to share God's word with you. COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented plague that we are of our time. Up to today, the global confirmed cases have reached 24 million and then more than 827,000 people have lost their precious lives. Among all the country, U.S. is the worst hit. One of every four confirmed cases occurred in our country. And now there are also 181,000 people who lost their lives. Since the stay at home order took effect in my state, the state of California, almost six months ago, the, 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 the pandemic is still severe. And then gradually people are losing their patience. The economy is badly hit and then many people need to endure the financial hardship and there are others who live in fear of infection and death. They cannot live a normal life. According to CDC's most recent research in June, among young adults between the age of 18 to 24, roughly 30.9% of respondents said that they have symptoms of anxiety and depression. 30%. That's almost one out of three. And then the 26.3 respondents reported a trauma and stress-related disorder because of the pandemic. And among them, one shocking news uh, uh, finding is that one in four young adults say they have come, contemplated suicide in the past month because of pandemic. It seems like a, during the trial time of a pandemic, there are many people who are afraid to die. And at the same time, there are many people who are afraid to live. And as born again Christians, what is our attitude toward the threat of the disease? The life, the death during the challenging time. And today's story is about someone who died. And we will soon get into that. I hope that you have a chance to read it before, but if not, open your Bible and then go with me. It is about someone who died and, and then uh, uh, and someone eventually was resurrected. When I was a child, 
I live in a small township called Nanto in Taiwan. And I, I was very afraid of funerals. When in the township where I live, when any man, any family member died, the family would pitch a large tent outside their house, and then they would hire monks to chant the scripture for days. And they would use the loudspeaker so everybody in the neighborhood were hear. Now that was the creepiest things to me. I think that the reason I was so afraid of uh, when someone died is probably because I watched a TV drama. Uh, in a drama, there was one uh, young woman who was murdered by her husband and then her body was buried underneath uh, the bathroom floor. She became a ghost. I still remember when the face of the woman ghost appeared on the screen. At that age, death was a, a horrible thing to me. Now, people don't like to die. Maybe you don't even want to talk about it. And there are people who are banking on the idea that the modern science will someday find or engineer the fountain of use. So they try to have their bodies or merely their heads frozen in a liquid nitrogen at the minus 320 Fahrenheit, awaiting that day when medical science will discover a way to re repair their dead cell and then the molecule structure so that they will be revived. And there's a company called Alcor Life Extension Institute located in Scottsdale, Arizona. They provide this body preservation service called cryonics. How much is the cost for cryonics? Well, 20,000 US dollars to have their entire body frozen. And then 80,000 to have just have their head frozen. Interesting, the CEO of Alcor cautions, we have to tell people that we don't even know how this will work, whether it is will work. However, their business is, is still thriving. A 50 year old, member of Alcor explained to a reporter why he wanted to use the company's service when he died. He said, for some strange reason, I don't want to die. I love being alive, okay? Let's get on the story today. When Jesus received word from Mary and Martha, that their, young, their brother Lazarus was sick, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. What is this the glory of God Jesus was referring to? Uh, simply speaking, it is God's, God's essence. It is God's nature. Only some things that only God has, God's power, God's goodness, God's holiness, and etc., etc. We saw, we call it God's glory. And Jesus was saying that the illness of Lazarus could express God more clearly. Through it, people may get to know God more, get to know who he, who, who he is. And not only that, God's Son, Jesus Christ, will also be glorified through it. How can someone's misfortune glorify God? Everyone agrees that the sickness is not welcome. Especially in the days of Jesus, right? The medical condition were poor. Sickness mean, meant certain risk of death. Illness and death are both bad things. How could people get to know God more and Jesus Christ through suffering? Since the human fall, sin has separated humanity from God. The ground is cursed, and there are natural disasters on earth. People get sick, and then some born with handicap. This is not God's original design. It's because it's the result of a human sin. However, God has been at the work to restore this broken relationship. And suffering is not made by God, but sometimes 
God uses Christians, non-Christians to suffering or even death to demonstrate his power and mercy so that human being can get to know him and then return to that relationship with him. Let's get back to the story. Martha and Mary wanted Jesus to immediately go to Bethany to attend their brother. But Jesus stayed where he was two more days. Now it was likely that the last red died soon after the messenger departed to find Jesus. Jesus was the only hope for the sisters to save their brother, Lazarus. However, since the day Martha and Mary sent for Jesus, they heard no reply. Then Lazarus died. Still, there was no show of Jesus. And now the funeral was over. Jesus finally came. Jesus could have come earlier to save Lazarus. Why didn't he come? The two sisters complained to Jesus. For what they see, they didn't have the full picture of who Jesus was and what Jesus was about to do. How many of you have been to Rose Parade in Pasadena on New Year's Day? And how many of you have been invited to take part of the parade? I was told that the total route, the entire parade route is 5.5 miles. And then the total length for all parade units, in average, every year, is about 4 to 5 miles. It's a pretty long parade. And let's say that you are part of uh, one of the marching band, you know, marching along with the parade. You don't know what is going on with other units, other floats and, and bands, except that the, your own band and, and what is ahead of you, perhaps. However, if you are riding in a helicopter or a blimp, now you can oversee how the entire parade marching through Colorado Boulevard. The same parade, different image. It all depends on which angle and height you see it. Mary and Martha did not have a Jesus' eyesight. All they see was their dead brother. Everything is over. They compared to Jesus. It was too late. And now Jesus was about to raise their eyesight. Let's read on. On Jesus' arrival, that's right, actually already died for, yeah, it, it been in a tomb for four days. Because the funeral happened on the same day when people died. The internal organs had decomposed and then the body bloated. Mary said to Jesus, if you had come, if you had been here, my father would not have died. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. But Martha did not understand what Jesus was talking about. She was saying, yeah, at the time, at the end time of resurrection, he will be resurrected. And Jewish people believe in end time resurrection. Pastor Henry Blackaby gave us the new, in light, new light, new insight on Jesus' conversation with Mar Martha and Mary. According to Blackaby, Jesus seemed to say to these two sisters, you are exactly right. If I had come, when you ask, your brother would have been healed. You know that I could have healed him. You, know, you have seen that I did that with other people. But if I come, when you ask me to, I would have healed him. But you will never experience anything more about me than you already know. I want you to know, today, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believe in me will live, even though they die. And then whoever lives by believing me will never die. Now verses 25 and 26 of chapter 11 are a great declaration of the Son of God. And immediately following that, 
Jesus would demonstrate that this is no empty declaration. He would raise, we would raise Lazarus from the death. According to Jesus' declaration in the original Greek, Jesus was not saying that he will provide resurrection and life, or he can point to some direction that, that has resurrection and life. He said that he was the resurrection and life. The original Greek in the gospel, ego in me, which in English translation as I am, refers to Jesus' essence. Seven times Jesus used ego Amy with a predicate to describe who he is and what he does. I am is actually God's name. Jesus is I am resurrection. I am the resurrection and I am life. What it means is that life must originate from life, and Jesus is the author of life. Life comes from him. Resurrection and life are put together because they are of the same subject matter. It's all his essence. Through faith in Jesus, the death of earthly life has become just a mark or a sign of a certain period and then a mark of sign or the beginning of the next period. The grandson of a Billy Grant said about his grandfather in this report. Uh, he said, this is the son of a Franklin Grant. He said, my grandfather once said, one day you will hear that Billy Grant has died. Don't you believe it? On that day, I will be more alive than ever before. I have just moved my address. I have just moved change my address. Now I trust that you all have some moving experience. Do you like to move? Well, I think it depends on where you move to. If you are moving from a 2,000 square foot single family home to an 800 square foot uh, uh, one bedroom apartment, now you have trouble fitting all your furniture. You would have wanted that. How in the world that you have accumulated so much junk over the years? But if you are moving to a 10-acre mansion, then you don't worry about the trouble. You wouldn't feel any trouble at all. The senior pastor, my colleague at TLC, Tiny Lutheran Church, Pastor Paul, he has moved 20 some times because of the ministry. When you are moving, on earth, you may not necessarily always move to somewhere better and better every time. But as a Christian, the last time you move is guaranteed to be the best because you are moving to heaven to the mansion that Jesus has promised that he will prepare for you. And therefore, through the faith in Jesus Christ, the death of a Christian is like a movie. Life is no longer bounded by death. And then the death no longer may willfully intrude in people's life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and then the fact that he raised Lazarus demonstrate to us in Christ, death has lost its power. Jesus will give eternal life to those uh, and then that eternal life will have no end. And therefore, a Christian could shout with Apostle Paul, where or death is your victory? Where or death is your sting? 1 Corinthians 15, 55. And now that is a true freedom. Even death cannot limit it. That is a true freedom. And therefore, that with that, that we have a newer and a higher eyesight to see illness, to see life and death. Those who are in Christ will be with God in eternity. Now this doesn't mean that Christians are immortal. It's just that from the moment that they believe in Jesus Christ, they are no longer under the power of death. 
and for this reason, the life of Christians is no longer defined by his or her achievement on earth, nor by the our appearance, but by their relationship with Christ. And their life, according to the promise of Jesus, is abundant life. And therefore, if anyone who is in Christ, there's no need to be afraid to live, and there's no need to be afraid to die. When our family member, relatives, or close friend passes away, we grieve. We miss the disease, and our heart is sad, and we weep. Now, in Lazarus' story, among the mourning family and friends of Lazarus, Jesus also wept, verse 35. Perhaps you will ask, since you was about to raise Lazarus from death very soon, why did he cry? Dear brother and sister, the tear of Jesus Christ is real. This pericope offers the Christian insight into the very heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. The very heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing how death had controlled human beings, experienced the death of their pain, Jesus just wept with them. Returning to the deaths of Lazarus and Martha and Mary, and then the, the mourning family, uh, and, and a bystander, they all said in effect that, that it was a Jesus' fault. It was Jesus' fault. Both sisters said, that, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even the Jews at the scene said, could not be he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? Now that was a sarcastic tone. People are trying to find out who is responsible for the death. And remember in John chapter 9, the person who had been born, uh, had been born blind, Jesus' disciple also asked who should be responsible for his ministry. And today in COVID-19 pandemic, we ask the same question, who should be responsible? And in effect, throughout human history, this question echoes down the years with every new tragedy. Why did God allow this? Why, did God, why didn't God step in and stop it? A New Testament scholar N.T. Wright said, the God who incarnated as a Jesus of Lazarus, of, of, of a Nazarene, Jesus of Nazarene, did not turn the tables on them and suggest that all of this happened because they were sinful and they now all to repent. He just wept with them. And then with the authority born of the mixture of tears and trust, he commanded Lazarus to come out of the tomb. If there is a word for our present situation, the brothers and sisters, facing not only a pandemic, but all the consequent the social and the cultural upheaval, I think it might be right there, according to rights. So what have we learned from Jesus' message? First, Jesus used his tear to demonstrate God's mercy for the sickness, death, and predicament of a human being resulted from a human sin. Christ is the God who weeps for human suffering. Second, Jesus redefines what it means when he says that God is in control in the midst of suffering. Listen to this. Through his resurrection, he has brought in the salvation to those who believe. He has redefined the life and death. The deliverance and an atonement happen at the same time. It's the same place. In Jesus Christ, there is the real life, the eternal life. Death has no effect on this new life. Jesus reminded the disciples that God did not create suffering. 
but suffering can be used by him to glorify himself and then his son is also glorified therefore let's refocus on our eyesight on the God who weeps, the Lord Jesus Christ and he also knows your tears he is the Savior he is mercy for us and he is also the Lord of life someday you will return to rule over the entire universe. And only from that angle and at a height, we will be able to see the full picture of life in the pandemic and also know how to live. And also know how to live. Let me tell you about Sally, an elderly and godly sister of my church. A few weeks ago, her husband fell in the backyard and in a suburb brain hemorrhage. I care for Sally and in a concern that she might be overly worried. While her husband was still in the ICU, I called Sally and asked her how she's doing. She said, she was not worried. She said, I already have a husband who is constantly anxious. If I'm like him, if I join him, would our family be miserable? I choose not to worry. I trust that my husband is in God's hand. God will take care of him. God will heal him. I have joined a group of people who make a face covering for those who are in need. This is where I'm going to spend my energy. This is the attitude that all of us should have during the pandemic. This is also Christians, the attitude Christians should have toward illness, toward life, and toward death. Before I close, I have two applications for you, dear brothers and sisters. First, during the pandemic, yes, we need to be vigilant in protecting ourselves, such as washing our hands and wearing face covering when we go out, but there is no need to be overly worried and too anxious to live a normal, normal life. Whether you are a Christian or non-Christian, we are going to die someday. No one can change the fact. However, pay attention to the message of Jesus. He has redefined death and life through his own death and resurrection. He invites us to establish an eternal relationship with him so we can have an eternal life in him. All we need is to receive this free gift from him. Only that we will have a better and higher angle to see the full picture of the disease, life, and death. While we are not afraid to die, we are also not afraid to live. Because the life given through the gospel is abundant life. The life is a powerful life because that is life, the new life given by our Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't settled that, eternal relationship which you consider today to call on the name of Jesus Christ. And second, God through the pandemic also reminds us the consistent call for repentance from the Gospels. Now is the time to be reflective of our, of our own life and our relationship with Christ and respond to his call for repentance. Repentance. Repentance from rejecting the gospel. Repentance from pursuing wealth, fame, and power over pursuing relationship with Christ. Repentance from the busy serving God, yet there's no God in our heart. Repentance from being self, of being self-interested and in a self-centered, which hurts the church and in a hurt the relationship with our brothers and sisters. Repentance from holding the worldly things. Now is the time to be reflected on how we can restore our relationship with God and then adjust our life accordingly. If our throughout the pandemic our focus has been on our difficulties, inconvenience, and then when we can resume to the pandemic time that we can just travel freely, see people freely, eat restaurant freely, 
can we move the focus of ourselves to those who suffer, those who are hit much worse than us during the pandemic and see what we can do for them? Like what Stalin did. Instead of worrying, instead of caring, considering our her own need. And let's focus on others. Making a few phone calls with those who might be lonely, making a few phone calls to see how they are doing, and then extend our care. And then why at this time when most of people have tender heart because of uh, all the trial time, share this wonderful news about the new life of them so that they may also have this wonderful eyesight that is high enough, it is a good angle to see this whole thing, to have the full picture about disease, about life and death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a faithful message at this pandemic time that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And through our relationship with him, he invites us to do so, that we may also partake in this eternal life. And then everything is now redefined. The earthly death now becomes just a mark, a sign. It just marks the beginning of a new eternal holy life. And what a wonderful gift of life for our God. And I pray that during the pandemic time, this message is ever refreshing for every Christian who have been focusing on their own inconvenience and misery. And then I may, they may endeavor to die, they are not afraid to die, and they are not afraid to live, but just concerning how the life can be used by God for the blessing for others. And I also pray for those who have not yet settled this eternal relationship that Jesus' invitation extend to them as well. During the pandemic, they can hear this wonderful news that God come become man and then die for die for sinners. I heard I pray that, that they can hear this wonderful, completed good news story. I pray that our brothers and sisters are willing to share the story with those who have not yet heard. And so that more and more people may call on your name. And I pray all of these in Jesus Christ's name.
现我，到需要你的人群中。欠我，再欠我，我愿付出我所有。再欠我，到需要你的人群中，充满我，充满我，用你爱来充满我，再一次紧握他们的手。Now, if you are able,、uh, would you rise from where you are and receive the benediction? Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, for now and until eternity. Amen. Amen.